Hey there, welcome to the Snakebird Podcast. My name's Josh. And I'm Steve. Together we invite you to join us as we explore the mysteries of Scripture, the realm of God, and freedom through Christ. So spread out your wings. And slither in place. Because this is Snakebird. Snakebird. Hey, welcome Snakebirds to another episode of the Snakebird Podcast. We're going back to the well and drawing upon one of our fan favorite formats, the Snakebird Profile, where we take a look at the ups, the downs, the good, the bad, and the ugly of various characters in the Bible and ask what we can apply or avoid in our lives from what we observe. So here's the question we've all been waiting for, Stephen. Who are we profiling today? Father Abraham (laughs) had many sons. You know the song. It is He Has Come, Abraham. And he is a foundational character in what we now call Christianity, isn't he, Josh? He sure is, yeah. And to let you behind the scenes and the, uh, the evolution of our podcast, we've decided to take on at least one or two major Bible characters a year, and I can't think of anyone better to profile than the granddaddy of us all. And you already sang the song, so... <laughs> <laughs> I stole it. <laughs> but yeah, he is. He is a, He is just a huge, massive character. And um, it's interesting that Abraham is actually a foundational character in Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. Wow, yeah. So, I mean, he really... Um, he's a starting point of a very important covenant, as we'll see, that stretches all the way to our modern day as God directed it to Christianity now and just it's it's a massive story a huge character in the Bible and other religions even yes yeah and I I mean he, not only is he in the Old Testament like a major character but he's also woven into the New Testament um, and so there's a lot of ground to cover I I want to let people know that this is probably going to be a two or three parter yeah. because if you saw the title of this it says Snakebird Profiles Abraham part one part one yeah Yeah. (laughs) of what you think maybe probably three probably three probably three we're gonna see how this goes exactly (laughs) (laughs) he's he's a big one and you know if you've done any any research into the bible at all you know he stretches from genesis to revelation yes so that's a biggie yeah and we gotta (laughs) talk about right arm left arm right foot (laughs) the song's as long as the story (laughs) (laughs) it's like the the lamb chop this is the song that never ends oh my gosh (laughs) please don't make me relive that song (laughs) i'm sorry i shouldn't have mentioned it So one thing I want to point out um, as we start off is where he sits in the timeline. And I would say think of Noah, which is a great place to start because that's pretty much a very memorable landmark in the timeline of Scripture. And just 10 generations after Noah, we see Abram. Then another six generations later, we see Moses. So that kind of gives you a bird's eye view of where he sits. Just a little over the halfway point between Noah and Moses, which would land in the neighborhood of about 2000 BC. Some debate the date, so we'll just leave you in the roundabout. But that's where we see him in the timeline. Yeah, I thought we'd go all the way back to Adam and Eve. (laughs) Sometimes I've been known to go all the way back to the garden, but I I, I summed it up right there the best I could. (laughs) Yeah, because Noah had Ham, Japheth, and Shem, and from the line of Shem, all of a sudden comes uh, these 10 generations, like you said. Yes, which it's fascinating if you ever... uh, One time I actually sat down and I wrote out the whole generation tree as I read it in Scripture, Mm -hmm. and it's fascinating to look at it on paper, Yeah, where they come from. In Abram, um, where he comes from, too. So that's that's about where we see him in the family tree from the flood. Yes, and when we meet him, we realize that he is around family, uh, much like uh, probably anybody in that culture would be, because... You're not just venturing out to necessarily the neighboring cities unless you absolutely have to. That's true. It's very generational. It's very... um, It was a nuclear family. (laughs) (laughs) As as big as it could get, right? Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, children helped tend the fields and stuff, so... Yeah, and I know we're going to talk about it, but let's just get the the elephant in the room out of the way. He married his half-sister. Yeah, yeah, he did. And we'll get to that, too, for sure. So talk about family. (laughs) (laughs) I don't don't know. Um, Well, that would lead us to also the culture that Abraham grew up in. Yeah. Um, 
24 verses before Abram's first mention, we see the infamous One World Order that tried to build the Tower of Babel, Mm -hmm. which um, I believe was much more than a mere tower, but whatever it was, it was a unified global statement of opposition to God. So you might have heard those silly jokes where baby boomers are blaming all the millennials for the world problems, and the millennials are like, well, you're the ones that raised us. <laughs> well, you might say that the Tower of Babblers generation raised Ab- Abraham's or Abram's generation. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Right there in Mesopotamia. That's right. Um, and he, I guess it's Ur of the Chaldees to be specific. Yes. And Ur was one of many regions in Mesopotamia. And for all you Bible nerds out there, at the time that Genesis was written by Moses, Ur was divided into at least four different regions itself. So Moses wrote Ur of the Chaldeans in order to specify to his readers the portion of Ur that he was talking about. And this is known as an anachronism or anachronism, I'm not sure, whichever way. But we find this in other portions of Scripture too, like the mention of Ramses, which is also found in Genesis. But... Abram grew up in this region called Ur within Mesopotamia, and some cool stuff I found out was each city in Mesopotamia actually worshipped a different god. Um, One of those cities was Babylon, who worshipped Marduk, which should ring some bells, and Abraham's city of Ur worshipped the gods Nana and Sin, which represented the moon slash moon god. And I really find it appropriate that the God's name was sin, because according to the true God, Abraham's place of origin was full of it. Mm, Yeah. Yeah. It's so funny that you talk about the anachronism. Yeah. Because I found something that said it's not an anachronism. Oh, really? Yeah. uh, I think it's Unger's Bible Dictionary said it's not an anachronism as many critics contend. It is rather an instance of numerous archaic place names being defined by a later scribal gloss to make clear a subsequent age where and what these places were to their history and locality that had been forgotten. Okay. So Well, it's... the scholar I found wasn't a critic. <laughs> okay. So the way he pointed it out, it was not critical at all. Yeah. It was actually made a lot of sense. So yeah. I guess there's two schools of thoughts. Yeah. I, but I appreciate both of them saying like it was used to define that location to that yeah. area. Which makes sense. And mm-hmm. we see that. And like I said, in the mention of Ramses, I, I believe that's definitely one for sure. Yeah. But um, they were saying, how are the Chaldeans uh, associated with Babylon? Because they weren't there yet. So, Oh, I could see it. Yeah. Yeah. Two schools of thought there. Yeah. So y'all, y'all take that uh, rabbit hole if you wish to. And uh, that's basically the rundown of the culture uh, that Abraham grew up in. It was very polytheistic and pagan, very sinful, and as seen right before the very mention of Abraham himself, very unified against the true God. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this moon god, Nanner, that's that's the uh, pronunciation I found. Okay. Uh, the way that they worshiped, that was really interesting. And I think um, even when he had this encounter with God, which we will see, it had to be so countercultural as to what he had known about um, their deities. Oh, okay. Yeah. That it, there, there was a lot of different regions and gods. There was it, We could have gone a lot further with all yes, of those. Yes, that's true. So shall we kick the story off, Josh, and uh, jump into where we see him first mentioned? Yeah, I want to say one more thing about uh, Ur real quick, is that um, it's not only one of the best known sites in southern Babylonia, but it's also about 150 miles from the head of the Persian Gulf. And as they've been um, excavating it, they found a lot of really neat things. They found treasures of unbelievable beauty. Um, They found some head attire. They found... uh, jewels. They found a tumbler and a cup of Queen Puabi, um, several musical instruments and beautifully crafted objects uh, demonstrated that this city had achieved a higher level of civilization up to 500 years before Abraham. And so uh, the Bible is pretty clear that Abraham's home was originally in lower Mesopotamia, and then he's going to immigrate to upper Mesopotamia on his way to Canaan. And I just thought that was really neat because they were saying that um, Ur might have even had upwards of 300,000 citizens during this this time wow. where he's said he's there around 2000 or 2100 BC. That's a lot of people. Yeah. And it's always fascinated me too when you look back, because they always have this, this um, kind of underlying tone of the older civilizations were that they're more primitive caveman. Yeah. We find out a lot of times with archaeology that 
they were way more advanced than they <laughs> were given credit <laughs> yeah, for. Yeah, exactly. The, and the timeline's that, off and all of that. I know the depictions that we get from some of the Hollywood movies, they don't show the elaborate yeah. lifestyles. That they act these... like just the wheel was invented. <laughs> yeah. When in reality, yeah. like huge, huge stones were moved that modern cranes would have trouble with. Yeah. Almost the mystery of like, how did this actually get built? Like mm-hmm. the pyramids or whatever. How yeah. did, how did these engineering feats take place? Puma Punku. Tiwanaku, check those places out. Those are some <laughs> fascinating um, sites. I thought you were speaking in tongues. <laughs> no, no, those are places, listener. <laughs> yeah. Go check them out. <laughs> okay, so at the end of Genesis 11, um, we see that Terah, who is the father of Abraham, had moved the family into Canaan. And then chapter 11 ends with Terah dying in a city uh, in Canaan by the name of Haran. The next thing we see um, is chapter 12, and um, I just had in my notes to read one through three. Are we good? Well, I did want to say this, because I believe that the immigration from Ur to Haran actually took place with something that's not in the Old Testament, but it's mentioned in the New Testament in Acts chapter 7, because they moved 300 miles north based on the call that Stephen writes about in Acts chapter 7, verses 2 through 4, and he said... Brethren and fathers, he's talking to the Pharisees, listen, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran and said to him, get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran and from there when his father was dead, moved him to this land which you now dwell. Yeah, that's super interesting that you mentioned that, because if you were just reading in Genesis, you almost get this flavor of, oh, I'm getting all of the details here as I read in Genesis. Yeah. And it's actually not true. That's a beautiful thing about God's Word, is the more we read, the more details come into focus. And when we read Acts 7, 2 through 4, we see that uh, God, it's not his first encounter in chapter 12. It actually started back when he was in Mesopotamia mm-hmm. under his father's rule and uh, or when he was with his family and all that. So that I found that very interesting, too, because it, it seems that his first encounter with Abraham started long before we see in Genesis. Yes. So that's that's really cool. So I'm going to go ahead and read verses one through three and we'll pick up from there. Now, the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And this is one thing I want to ask here, too, is, and we kind of already stepped into this pool, but if Abram grew up in a culture that believed in other gods, then how on earth did suddenly he hear and obey the true God of which he's never been taught to believe in? Mm. He was in that culture. And obviously God God has his ways. He picked Abraham. He chose Abraham in that culture. And he, he was revealing himself. And Stephen even lets in a little secret that he appeared to Abram. Mm-hmm. He didn't just speak to him back when he was in Mesopotamia. He appeared to him. And we'll, we'll see that that is actually the preferred method of God appearing to Abraham throughout uh, I think chapters 12 to 50. So it, it's that, that's really fascinating to me, I thought. Yeah. And so that also, that brings up another question that I found a lot of talk and debate on online. Um, a lot of the commentators were, were kind of back and forth on this. Some said that Abram was, in fact, an idol worshiper. Mm. And others said that he had always doubted the false gods. And the thing about commentators is we find some taters are more common than others. <laughs> <laughs> and they're not, they're not always clear cut. So whatever the case may have been, I have a view that from the very moment of the fall of mankind, people started to worship the creation rather than the creator. As we learn in Romans one twenty five, where it says they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the created things rather than the creator. So I believe that especially that far back, which would have been much closer to the garden than we are now, people have always had that gut feeling when they were worshiping false gods, that intrinsic knowledge of God that tugged at them. You might even call it a form of conscience that would be almost like a precursor to the Holy Spirit. These are just thoughts that I'm that I'm yeah. thinking on. And I believe that Abraham knew who the real God was due to generational stories along with that void 
that only the true God can fill. So whether he had previously worshipped false gods or not, he heard the voice of the true God in verses 1 through 3 of Genesis 12. And as Stephen pointed out in Acts 7 before Mm -hmm. that, and he decided to follow that call. Well, and I would say to that, we all worshipped false gods before we came to the true God. And Granted. some of us still struggle with idols today because it's, you know, there's something that's always trying to pull on the throne of our heart that says, hey, love me more than than the Lord God himself. Very good point. That's and, true. I mean, <laughs> you know. I mean, and that's that's one of those layers that you could say, well, this is always a thing. Yeah. That's that's a good point. Yeah. And one more on this note um, thing that I'll point out is um, an interesting thing I found is a story in the Jewish Midrash, and it's also found in the Quran. But the story is about Abram's father, who was a maker and seller of idols. And one commentator writes this about the story. Abram had come to doubt the validity of idols being gods. And so when his father was absent one day, Abram smashed one of the idols and put a hammer into the hand of one of the other idols. When his father returned, he was naturally upset and demanded to know what had happened. Abram told his father that one idol had attacked the other and smashed it. His father then declared this to be impossible, for idols were lifeless creations of stone, wood, and metal. Therefore, Abram proved his point that idols were only man-made, not God. Thus, according to the Midrash, Abram began his journey to discover the real God. Oh, wow. And obviously, this falls under extra-biblical sources, which sometimes are great resources. But whether it's true or not, I found it an interesting read. Yeah. I also think it's interesting at how old Abram is at this point in his life. Because he's at least 70 years old while they're in Ur of the Chaldees getting ready to immigrate to Haran. That's true. I saw one commentator said that Abram was 50 years old, he believed, when he first heard the call of God. And Abram wavered in his decision until about 75 before obeying. Yeah, I saw that and I I wrestled with that because I wasn't so sure about it. But Yeah, I, I don't know either. Um, yeah. Because we, we, there's always there's always going to be some debate here and there on the timeline, but we talk about Mesopotamia and that far back. We don't know exactly when God was calling him. Yeah, <laughs> we can't just Google that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's some things we can't just Google. Very some things Google <laughs> won't answer. But Terah dies at 205 years old, and now that call is renewed here in Genesis chapter 12. And I like that. Um, Hebrews 11.8 says, It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and to go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. Yeah, and that's a good point to point out as we go through this for sure. Stepping out, going, all right, you're calling me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to just take that next step. And it's hard to say, I I don't even know which way I'm headed. Yeah. And also stepping into a new role, he had been following his father, Terah, and now he is the patriarch leading his family into these places. I am the captain now. Yes, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) And here's some things we know about this departure. Um, Abraham was 75 years old when he started this Mm -hmm. journey. Yeah. And he took his wife, Sarai, and his nephew, Lot, and all of their servants as well. And God calls Abram to leave and that lands us in Genesis um, 12, 6 through 9, which I thought I would just go ahead and read unless you had anything else, Josh. I just wanted to say I, I love Bible names, and I especially love looking to see if they have any type of um, meaning behind them. And Abraham means father of many nations, but Abram means exalted father, which is kind of interesting that the name gets changed along the way, which almost indicates some sort of humbling from exalted father to just actually fulfilling the promise that God gave him. But Sarah or Sarai's name means princess, which we're going to find out a little bit more detail here on why uh, that name was so appropriate for her. A uh, lot means covering, which uh, some people said it just means covering. And then there's another reference to it in the book of Isaiah, which actually means a covering that 
reveals sadness because it, it separates you from the glory of God, which I thought was interesting with some of the things that happen with Lot. And then I wanted to mention that Haran, his name means mountaineer, and that's one of Abraham's brothers. But the other one named Nahor, his name just means snoring, snorer, or <laughs> mouth breather. <laughs> so I'm Nahor? <laughs> yeah, I think maybe like the parents had him and this little baby's just sawing logs and they're like, well... We have to name him Snorting, you know. You know what's going to happen. When my wife hears this episode, she's going to start calling me Nahor. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Come here, you big bear, Nahor. <laughs> oh, that's great. Something <laughs> awesome for me to look forward to. <laughs> that's great. No, that's that's uh, fascinating. And I've always loved the, the comical part of Abram's exalted father. And it's just ironic because yeah. of the whole, you've heard it, I'm sure, <laughs> listener. <laughs> He doesn't. He doesn't have a ton of children and all that. We'll get into exalted that. exalted father. Yeah, it, yeah, it's funny. Ironic. Okay, so Genesis twelve six through nine. Here we go. Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem, to the oak of Morah. Now the Canaanite was in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, "To your descendants I will give this land." So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Then he proceeded from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Abraham journeyed on, continuing toward the Negev. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting at this point. Um, again, looking up more names, uh, Mora, uh, which depending on which version of the Bible you read, some would say the plain of or the oak or terebinth of Mora. But what that means is hill of the teacher. And so it seems like every step that Abraham or Abram takes, he's having these encounters with God. And God keeps reaffirming and saying, hey, I'm teaching you who I am through this journey. And of course, he's seeing Canaanites and he's like, well, okay, you're calling me to this land, but I'm starting to see inhabitants already. How's this going to work out? And I like that Lot's following him at this point because now he's probably taken on the role of Abraham's heir, especially since Abraham is an exalted father without any kids. And, Just a um, huge following. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and I, I don't know if you came across this, but again, leaning into the names, Bethel means house of God. And uh, AI or hi, <laughs> which is <laughs> which is one of the guys uh, with the one of the ways that it's pronunciated means heap of ruins. And the commentator that I read was like, that's what we are when we're journeying in this life towards God. The world's behind us, the heap of ruins and the house of God is before us. But we're just taking this step by step journey with the father. Yeah, that's some great things to point out. I, I thought it was neat, too, because. Um, I thought of of hiking. If you've ever gone hiking after a long, tiresome, like uphill climb, sometimes you come to a point where you can rest and take a look at the ground you've covered and the ground you have yet to cover. And God brings Abram to these points where he tells him, you know, you see this land, I'm going to give this to you and all of your descendants. Mm -hmm. And the first thing Abram does is builds an altar to God at this point, which is, is like a landmark as well as an altar, making the statement, God has called me here, and here is a landmark for all to see um, the true God of whom I follow. Yeah. And it, it's just, it's a really neat thing. It's a constant, um, it's a constant focus every every step of the way. Yes. Yeah. I I like to call them the Ebenezer stones, you know, yeah. and you have that song that says, here I lay my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I've come. And what that just stands for is not uh, the Christmas carol. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's uh, no, it's stones of remembrance and it's stones to recall, hey, this is how God's been faithful in my life. This is the journey that I've taken. And we see that not only is he building these altars of worship saying, God, I'm worshiping you along the way. We're going to see him revisit this place. Mm -hmm. And that's the neat thing about miles and milestones and memories that we can set up in our lives as Christians saying, hey, I got baptized on this day. Yeah. Hey, I asked Jesus into my heart on this day. Hey, I made my first proclamation of public faith on this day. Things like that. I, I think those are all Ebenezer stones in my and. I think those are all Ebenezer stones in our lives. Yeah, no, that's a fantastic point. That's and so true. And um, I think also at this, at the end of um, 
of this portion we just read of like the light at the end of the tunnel. People talk about um, things getting better as you get closer, yeah. and, and in a sense they do. But um, Abram gets to this point at Bethel and AI right there, and he builds this altar, and it's like this journey God's taking him on. But we see at the end of verse 9 that from that point, he heads towards the Negev. Mm -hmm. And that means um, dry land or desert, some translations will put it. Mm -hmm. So yes, God has brought Abram this far, but Abram can also see that he's being led now into the desert, yet he still follows. And I think that really speaks to the unconditional faith that Abram had in God, which landed him in Hebrews. Mm -hmm. At least it in this instance, yeah, <laughs> because we'll see <laughs> variations of that faith as we move. It plays out and then it doesn't play out and then it plays out and then it doesn't play as out. As does it with us all. Yes, exactly. That's, <laughs> that's the life. Can I say one more thing about remembrance stones? Yeah. I can't help but think of the Lord of the Rings with the beacons. Nice. <laughs> and I don't know why, but I always think of like, it was set up exactly like the place that it needed to be for them to see it, uh, for the message to be carried. And, yeah. and I just have this idea of like in our lives to make sure that we set those, those memories and those milestones within range of saying, Hey, I can look back on them and revisit them enough for it to be a help in time of need. And I don't know, I might be stressed it a little bit, but you know, if the beacons are lit, then Gondor calls for aid. <laughs> <laughs> Very good visual. I like it. Yeah, no, it's, it's great for reflection as well as, um, to push you into the next. Yeah. So that's yeah. great. Okay. So Abram and the gang just had this mountaintop experience where they built an altar at the place God led them or Abram did. And they're starting this new life on the way to the promised land, um, or a promised land. And what do you know? There's a drought in the land. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just so relatable, I think, as we have all been here at that first hurdle that was never anticipated. But nevertheless, Abram, like a trooper he is, um, he makes his way to Egypt in order to maneuver this um, famine in the land, which had to be frustrating. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean... You think about it, you're like, hey, I'm going to where you called me. And then the next thing I know, I have to ab abandon ship on that plan and head somewhere else. Yeah. Or that plan's just a lot more uncomfortable than I anticipated. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah. this is frustrating. <laughs> yeah. But what does God use those dry times to do in our lives? It, it's to stretch us and to grow us it in those wilderness us. periods. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. But he doesn't choose to grow as much in uh, Egypt, does he? No, no. And later in scripture, we find out just how premeditated this thing we're fixing to describe is. But as he approaches Egypt, he begins to fear what might happen when the Egyptians see his beautiful wife, doesn't he? Yes. And I like that he says, look, you're a very beautiful woman. That's what the New Living Translation says. Yeah. And from what I can see in all the translations, Sarah was more than just pretty. She was drop dead gorgeous. Yeah. The type of gorgeous that men would kill for. Yeah. So he had he had some concern here as they approached this land. She was she was a bombshell. <laughs> and so uh, Abram has this scheming going on, and he says, "When the Egyptians see you, they will say this is his wife. Let's kill him so we can have her." Yeah, he's like, "Listen, babe, when we get in town, you got to say that you're my sister, so that no Egyptians kill me to have you." <laughs> And we're going to find out um, that this was long premeditated before this event. Yeah. This isn't the first time they discussed this. No. <laughs> it's the first time we're coming across it in, in Genesis here, but they talked about this before. Yeah. And he goes, and if they're interested in you, they're going to treat me really well. <laughs> Which, <laughs> yeah, that's really shady. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, dude, this is your wife. Yeah. So, um, as expected, Pharaoh does, in fact, notice Sarah to be breathtakingly beautiful. And what do you know? Brings her into his house and gives Abram sheep, oxen, donkeys, male and female servants, and male donkeys and camels. Let's not forget those. And the reason... You, you will be a fine addition to my harem. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And uh, it, the reason is flattery, bribery for this beautiful sister of Abram. And honestly, um, one of the first things I thought of as I read this was, man, Abram seems to be acting like a real sleazebag. Uh -huh. I mean, that, that's what it comes across as for sure. And uh, I get that he's trying to survive here, but he's, he's trading his matrimony in fear. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that's a terrible thing. Yes. 
Yeah, for a father of the Fae, he is really acting out in fear. And this is one of those instances where we love to be snake birds because we can say, hey, we see so many great things, but we can also take lessons from the not so great things. Yeah. And one one thing that has always stood out to me, and this is this is something that I, I've talked with people before about, but um, many have really come down on Abram um, in this situation for merely telling a half truth. And the problem with that is that I've found over five instances in the Old Testament where God not only allows half truths, but in some cases he flat out instructs them. And it seems to me that if there was sin in this half truth, it was in relation to two things. Uh, number one, trusting in deception rather than God, which is based in fear. And number two, he was willing to allow the half truth to result in adultery. Mm. And so he was gaining things and risking adultery, and that seemed to be okay with him. And so um, that's something that's always stuck out with me. Uh, does this mean that God encourages half truths? I don't think so. But when certain situations arise, um, they seem to emerge. And depending on the heart and motive, God can even bless the outcome or punish. So when all is said and done, we've got to take those and make those decisions, those executive decisions for ourselves under the influence of the Holy Spirit. But that's one thing I've always run into when I come to this portion of the story of Abraham. Yeah. Yeah, the, the the circumstances behind this are very tragic because you're like, dude, why? Wh what's your motivation other than fear? Yeah. Because it's not going to end well. How are you going to get out of here with your wife in tow? Because all of a sudden she is part of the Pharaoh's harem. And if we know anything from history, once a woman is in that harem, she is supposed to live there until she dies. Yeah. And God doesn't approve of this situation at all either. No. As he soon finds out, um, it, it'll obviously lead to adultery and it, it'll be extremely problematic in God's will and plan for mm -hmm. him and Sarai, too. Yeah. <laughs> so um, Pharaoh finds out, though, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, because God shows his disfavor with this. Yeah. And at, at this point, I don't know if Sarai let Pharaoh in on the secret or how Pharaoh found out, but he quickly notices a few repercussions of taking her into his home. Uh, namely, some great plagues that fell on his house, <laughs> and, which I don't want to make light of this, but the Egyptians really must have had a unique phobia to plagues, I think, <laughs> because I hate plagues as much as the next guy, but God must have really known that plagues really irritated the Egyptians, <laughs> because as much as we see them used um, to scream uncle in the Old Testament, I mean, I'm just I'm just laying it out there. <laughs> oh my gosh. I've never thought about having plague awareness. <laughs> <laughs> they just really hated plagues. Yeah. Is there any way where we can purchase plague protection? <laughs> <laughs> and God used it. Yeah. Well, there is another instance in a situation much like this where a guy is warned in a dream. And it makes you wonder if maybe that happened with Pharaoh, but it doesn't specifically say so. He did have a sense of plagueness he did. going on, going, well, wait. <laughs> wait a minute. I see plagues coming. <laughs> Something's wrong. I don't remember the day going to be night for like a week long or whatever. It must be this new event that just happened. This woman in my house. These Volkswagen-sized hailstones falling outside just on my crops and animals. Yeah. <laughs> this isn't natural. Yeah. <laughs> did you, did somebody order a million and one frogs to be around my household, you know, or yeah. whatever? On my field and not yeah. thine? Yeah. <laughs> Bring us thou no plague? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we could we could go on and yeah. on with this, but yeah. yes, the, the plagues came. Sharon it, didn't belong in the house. Clearly, it may not be as funny to you as it is to us. Don't think. It's yeah. <laughs> so he calls for Abram, and he goes, "What in the world? Why have you done this to me? Why didn't you tell me that she was your wife, dude? Come this on, this is not cool, man." Yeah. And why did you say she is my sister and allow me to take her as my wife? Now then, take her back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get out of here. Yeah, and he has his men escort Abram along with um, all of his new bribes and prizes out of the region at oh, this point. Oh, man. He gets to keep them. Talk keep... about blood money, huh? Yeah. Or just gross gifts. Yeah, it really is. I like that they walk him to the border and just like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> take it and go. <laughs> yeah. Do not return, please. Yeah, for real. And so... Abram has just dipped his toes in the Egyptian waters, and now he's headed back out to the desert as a richer man, so we see in verse 2 of chapter 13. Mm -hmm. 
And we see that Abram um, journeys all the way back to his this spot between Bethel and Ai. And this is the place, like Josh mentioned before, he, he revisits it. It's where he first built that altar. And um, Abram calls um, on the name of the Lord at this landmark that had been previously set up. And he returns to worship again. And I, I really think that's interesting because... It goes to show his heart, and it, it should go to show our hearts that even in times of maybe not making the best decision, and you could say, hey, that, that half-truth, acting out of fear was a sin, but a lot of times we need to repent, and we need to come back, and we need to worship God, and I appreciate that he came back to this place, and maybe he had a little bit of a come-to-Jesus meeting in a sense of going, okay— That was a difficult situation. That was not the greatest chapter in my life, but let's get back on track, God. Yeah, that's and this scene is really application central Mm -hmm. because, um, man, does that not speak to all of our lives? It does. We we go through these mountaintop experiences and then we make the dumbest decisions we we could ever make or whatever happens. Maybe it's just a season where it's not you know, your decision. It's just a bad season. Yeah. But you come back to this point, you run back to the one who you know is in control and the one that you rest in. Yeah. And uh, yeah, huge application we can take from that. And you have to make a decision that, you know, because a lot of times the conviction, actually the, a lot of times the condemnation that will come from the enemy wants to keep us down. Mm -hmm. And what we have to say is when I fall, through God's strength and through his grace, I will get back up yep. and I'm going to continue on the path that he established for me and not just wallow in our sin and our sorrow. Yeah. And you said it through his strength, through yeah. his grace, yeah. because we can't do it ourselves. We can't get up on our own. We can't face that type of condemnation on our own. No. And it's, if we try, we're going to. Yeah. It's it, only through him that we can do that, yeah. which um, thus Abraham goes back to that central place. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Okay. So. Remember, all this while, Lot, Abraham's nephew, is tagging along with his uncle. And uh, we see that not only Abram has become very wealthy, but Lot, too, has become pretty well off, hasn't he? Yeah. Yeah, he's he's really uh, been fortunate by hanging out with Uncle Abram. Yes. And he's gotten a lot of stuff. Yeah. And they, they get so much stuff, him and, and Abram, that uh, they, they actually come to the scene where um, the servants are in this rivalry, Lot's people with Abraham's people, the yeah. servants. And um, that's naturally what happens when people are cooped up together in quarrel. We saw this in quarantine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it just happens. I was thinking like sharks and jets, you know, like <laughs> every time they'd come around and they'd be like, who's going to feed the animals or the well, you know, to get water. And they're just like, they got their switchblades and they're like, yeah. you know, I don't know, growling at each other or whatever. <laughs> As I first read it, I thought of like the Hatfields and McCoys or something, but this wasn't really a family feud, especially not between Abram and Lot. No, just their herdsmen. Their herdsmen. They were they were childishly bickering back and forth. Well, and it, it makes well, sense. And maybe not childishly. It, it was it was crowded. It makes Dad sense. It. Yeah, they're, <laughs> they are probably trying to provide for a ton of livestock with limited resources, and they're probably going, hey, we're just shoulder to shoulder here. We have no breathing room. Yeah, no, that's true. That's true. And I think, I mean, we're going to see some insight here in a little bit that maybe Lot did have a little bit of a heart to separate from Abram. Mm. And so uh, this might be the early stages of that brew. Yeah. But anyway, um, Genesis 13, eight through 12 is where we're at here. So I'm going to go ahead and read that. So Abraham said to Lot, please let there be no strife between you and me, nor between my herdsmen and your herdsmen. For we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If to the left, then I'll go to the right. If to the right, then I will go to the left. Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the valley of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go to Zoar. So Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled in the cities of the valley." and moved his tents as far as Sodom. So here we have Abraham, or Abram still, in a spirit of complete humility telling his his nephew, um, 
you can take whatever portion of land that you want. Mm. You go to the right, I'll go to the left, vice versa. And obviously we can see through that scripture, there is, there's a greener pasture and he, yeah. he's not going for it. Abram's not. He says, you go here, I'll go there. Yeah. Let's not let anything between us. It's, it really speaks to the heart of Abram. And the wisdom of it going, hey, I'm not going to choose the preference. I'm going to let you get whatever whatever you want. Yeah. You know, it's probably also, I just clicked in my head, it's probably part of the peace of following God and knowing that you're on the right track, that even if you get the lesser of what people consider better, God's going to make that better because mm-hmm. he's in it. Yeah. So that's kind of the heart of Abram in this. And um, Lot chooses immediate gratification is what it is. The greenest, most beautiful land. And um, honestly, I mean, we've all been there. We can't blame him in instances of our own lives when we do the same thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, the problem is that Sodom and Gomorrah are the cities that sit on that piece of real estate. Yeah. And we know what they're known for, don't we? We do. And the New King James says that he pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. And then the next verse in that scripture that you were reading, it says, but the people of this area were extremely wicked and constantly sinned against the Lord. And so you have to wonder, is he setting himself up to fail yeah. by positioning himself where he did? That makes me think of, he says, even as far as Sodom, like, yeah, like, like it's a stretch. Yeah. He's pushing the envelope. Exactly. Like he had a choice and he said, well... I could go to um, the nice part of Las Vegas or I could pitch my tent even as far as the strip. Exactly. Because there are really nice parts of Las Vegas. Yeah. It's not all just the the sinful nature of Sin City. It's like he actually chose to plant his tent or to pitch his tent as far as those limits. Yeah. So we, we kind of see a little bit of a differential here in hearts with Abram and Lot. You know, Abram has this, you choose whatever, I know God's in it. Lot is like, I'm going to push the envelope. Yeah. And I've always wondered, and I don't know if you've thought about this, but I always wondered what would have happened if Lot had chosen the other side. How would it have worked out for Abram? Would he have been like, I am going to avoid those two cities like the plague? Mm-hmm. Just ask Pharaoh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I'm going to avoid those two cities like the plague because I see their wickedness before God. And and now that I have this walking relationship and this, this journey where I'm worshiping him, I don't want to take part in their... Uh, sinful ways. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a lot to think about Mm -hmm. too. That's pretty neat. Yeah. I think that's a real applicational point is that in our daily decisions, we have to choose wisely because our commitments direct our trajectory. And I don't know what would have happened if Lot had chosen the other side, but I don't believe that Abram would have got sucked in like Lot did to the debauchery and the sinful ways of Sodom and Gomorrah. And I have to think that while we are in this world, Jesus said, you don't have to be of this world. And he was, he was that preservation factor of salt and light wherever he went. You know, a lot of times people were going like, well, why is he in the presence of sinners? And, and they were always like, well, if he didn't eat with sinners, well, then who would he eat with? He would be dining alone every night. And so there is that opportunity for us to still have an influence, but not necessarily be taking part in. Yeah. It's the sick who need the doctor. Mm-hmm. So yeah. that whole concept. Now, I think you're right. I think regardless of the situation Abraham uh, would have been in, it, it was his constantly turning to God and depending on God, his commitment to God that would have always been his savior in yeah. whatever situation he was in. Yeah. Though he did have moments where he he caved to fear and mm-hmm. he caved to these he always returned to God and putting his faith in God, building those altars, those landmarks um constantly in worship to God because that's that was his true commitment though he did fail. Yeah. And that's another reason we do these snake bird profiles is because we don't want to show that there's Bible characters who've been dipped in bleach and they have no blemishes on their record. Mm-hmm. I appreciate that we have the the failings at times and the go where you go, "Well, why'd you do that?" and and they turn around and look at your life and you're like, "Well, why'd you do that?" Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? Because I'm a sinful person who's yeah. just trying to walk by grace. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great point. So God takes Abram aside after this deal between him and Lot is done. And um, he once again reminds Abram that um, as far as his eye can see, this land is going to be his. 
And if one can number the dust of the earth, then they would be able to number the descendants of Abram. Mm. And I'll, I'm, just like we've been talking about, Abram returns to God. He finds his rest in God. And God is just as faithful, more faithful, to meet him where he is and remind him, keep coming back to me because this is what you have coming. Mm -hmm. Yes, even though you head to the Negev, to the desert in these times, remember that at the end of this, this is what I have for you. Yeah. And so I love that. And and um, chapter 13 ends with Abram moving his tent to Hebron and building yet another altar to God. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really love this constant focus Abram uh, of Abram to recognize God wherever he goes. Wherever he goes, he puts a landmark for all to see, this visible sign of worship to yes. God. Yeah, and that's what he is uh, basing his relationship with God on, is worship of him, is recognizing his positional place. And I think that that's so important for us as Christians, is coming back and saying, God, I recognize that you are uh, number one, that you're everything, and I worship you for that. Yeah. Okay, guys, so I really felt like this was a decent stopping point in the story of Abram, and yes, we're still calling him Abram because we haven't gotten to that part of the story yet, Yeah. but um, the next time we'll be hitting the ground running, won't we, Josh, with a war between kings, uh, Black Ops mission, Abraham goes to the rescue in. Yes. It's going to be, we got a lot coming around the pike. Yeah. Five kings versus four kings. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> exactly. And honestly, it gets wilder from there. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not just like a skirmish. I mean, this is all out war. It is. It's a, it's a wild story. It really and there's is. a lot of mystery um, in certain portions, I think. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be, it's going to be good. Yes. And we're going to keep rolling along with the story of Abram, soon to be Abraham. And I'm sorry if I've called him Abraham a couple of times throughout yeah, this. Everybody's already thought it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But until then, um, I thought it'd be good to to share a takeaway point from Abram's character so far. I know that we usually do these at the end, but as we take a, a bite at a time out of this story, um, I've got one thing that I saw in Abram's character that I thought I'd point out on this portion, and that would be that he answered God's call. Mm. Um, as this story unfolds, we're going to see uh, the fantastically amazing repercussions of Abraham answering the call of God. But none of these things would have happened in Abram's life had he rejected that call. Um, there were times that Abram procrastinated his obedience already in this story. But God's patience with Abram, coupled with Abram's acceptance of the call, led to a door being opened in Abram's life that no army could stop from overtaking the world. And I would just say... Big, big takeaway point. And listener, if um, th the same could be said of you answering that call today. So if you hear it, now's the time to answer it. Because mm -hmm. um, as we're just getting into this story of Abram, you could just be getting into the story of God's call to you. Mm. And I really echo that uh, application because I had something similar. I said, step out in faith. And I, I love the fact that he and his family left what could have been an estate or a legacy um, in leaving that for what God had called him to do. And sometimes we have to leave behind or sacrifice good to get God's best. Mm. And we might be looking at a situation and we might be going, well, this is, this is okay. This is fine. And yet God's saying, no, I'm calling you to step out. And maybe that is a life of unbelief where you're going, no, I have three meals a day and I'm, you know, I'm in a job where I make enough money and blah, blah, blah. And you look at your life, but you're like, I'm not satisfied. And God's like, well, you think that's good, but let me call you to my best. Mm -hmm. And that happens in the life of believers. And that happens in the life of unbelievers as they enter in to salvation. And I really feel like for Abram, if he had stayed where he was, he probably had a decent life but he would never achieve and never receive what God had for him in the long run. You know, I think of people who would even argue with me that money does buy happiness. Mm. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't. It, the satisfaction that we, that we gain is by following God's will for our lives. Mm -hmm. And until we're in that, 
there's no satisfaction that's going to be really had. Yeah. I mean, there's there's bursts of joy here and there, but the satisfaction will always be longed for. Yeah. There's a theologian that says, mo money, mo problems. <laughs> <laughs> and he's he ain't wrong. <laughs> Lil MacArthur or something? Is it, is it? I'm trying to think of a rap name mixed with a theologian. I'm Don't sorry. know. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. Leave it to me to turn a good moment sour. Oh, no, I said it. I said it. <laughs> no, no. So true. So true. And I, I really hope you guys have enjoyed this so far. I mean, we hear the story uh, of Abram as even children in church. And uh, maybe even if you didn't go to church, everybody's heard of Father Abraham. Yeah. But um, it's going to be really awesome, and it's already been awesome to see um, th- how it's kicked off and how uh, this man, we're gonna, like I said, we're going to hit the ground running on this next one. Mm-hmm. And it's really cheesy to only know the song and not know the story. And so exactly. That's why we're so glad to bring it to you. For sure. And uh, I just, I appreciate that God is always faithful. And when he makes a promise, he's going to keep it. And I appreciate the fact that as we pick up next time, we're going to be able to keep running with those promises that God keeps keeping. And those promises get better and better too. They do. Yeah. Yeah. Stretches to you and me. Yeah. So it's awesome. That's awesome. All right, guys. Well, that is all we have for this portion, and uh, we hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, uh, you know we ask that you um, subscribe and and share this if it's helped you out with a friend, whether it be in conversation or on social media, however it may be. um, Please share the show. That helps us out, helps the gospel get some more ears. Yes. And then if you feel so inclined, leave us a review or write us a review or connect with us Um, more than anything, more than a review, more than any of that. uh, Connection is what we're just praying for and and knowing that we're making an impact in your life. And so if you can send us an email at connect at bsnakebird.com or if you want to connect with us through um, Facebook, that would be excellent because we would love to come alongside you and support you, pray for you, talk to you, serve you in any way that we possibly can because that's what this ministry is about. And that's why we're doing this week after week. Yeah, and don't forget that, guys. Reach out to us. We love your feedback. We want to know what's going on with you. Um, oftentimes, we see something like a podcast or a YouTube video, and we just have this idea that it's there's not a real connection there. There is. There yes. is. So please re- reach out to us. Yeah, and you just reminded me that we are now uploading all of our content and podcasts as videos on YouTube. And so if you're looking to listen to us on maybe that platform versus the other one that you've found, uh, you can go to the Snakebird channel on YouTube and all of our podcasts are there in just a really easy video form. Yes. Yeah. And though our videos are, are not quite to Hollywood level yet, <laughs> the, I mean, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Yeah. It's just a stationary page. <laughs> you got a real good picture to look at while listening to well, us. Some people love to just listen to YouTube. I've heard of that. I do it. Oh, I do okay. it. Yeah. No, I do. So. I just thought it was funny. <laughs> you mock us? No. I do. Bring us thou YouTube plague? <laughs> Bring us thou no video? <laughs> okay, that's enough. Okay. Enough so, internet, so they say. Uh, yeah, that's that's it. Always remember, whatever you do, wherever you go, no matter what life throws at you, there's never been a better time to follow the words of Jesus. And be a snake bird. bird.